Hi, everyone. We're going to start in just a minute or two, uh, just to let everybody log into Zoom uh, this afternoon. We're looking forward to the conversation. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and, and get started. So uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Tock. I am director of Future Ed. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar on strategies for addressing teacher shortages. As you know, debates raged in policy circles and the press last summer over whether the nation's schools would have enough teachers when students returned to classrooms this fall. But many, if not most of the nation's nearly 100,000 public schools did start the school year with teacher shortages of some sort, slowing student recovery from the pandemic and prompting a plethora of responses by policymakers. As a result, it seems like it's a good time to step back, try to get a clear picture of the nature of the shortages and what's causing them, and ask whether policymakers' responses have been the right ones. So we're very fortunate to have a panel of national experts to help us do that this afternoon. Tequila Brownie is Chief Executive Officer of TNTP and earlier in her career led teacher effectiveness efforts for Memphis City Schools. Uh, Dan Goldhaber is Director of the Center for Analysis of Longitudinal Data in Education Research and a leading national researcher on teacher issues. Tara Kinney is a former elementary and high school teacher and a lawyer, and she is currently Chief of Staff and Director of State Policy at the Learning Policy Institute. Heather Pesky is President of the National Council on Teacher Quality and a former Senior Associate Commissioner of Education in Massachusetts, where she led the state's efforts to strengthen its teacher corps. And Rob Weil is Director of Research, Policy, and Field Services for Education Issues at the American Federation of Teachers uh, here in Washington. Thank you all uh, panelists for joining us today. Uh, we're gonna have you share your insights into the shortage challenge for the first part of the webinar, and then we'll take audience questions via Zoom's Q&A function. So put your questions in, in the Q&A uh, and we'll get to as many as we can uh, in the latter part of, of the uh, webinar. But, but now let's just jump into our conversation. So. Obviously, in order to select the right solutions to, to teacher shortages, we need to be sure we're solving the right problems. So Tara, Tara I'd like to start with you. Can you give us a picture of, of the teachers we're lacking? What is the, the problem we need to solve there? Yeah, thanks, Tom. And um, thanks to Future Ed for hosting this really important conversation today. I'm excited to listen and learn and participate. Um, so let me just give a little bit of a snapshot of uh, teacher shortages as we know them today and, and just acknowledge, right, we have a lag in national data. So we're piecing different signals together from the data um, and trying to make sense of where we are right now. Um, so a few kind of points that I would make one is the U.S. Department of Education, right? According to data that's reported to them by states this year, right? We have every state reporting shortages in at least one area. 48 states are reporting shortages of special education teachers, 46 of science teachers, and 44 of math teachers. Um, and then this week we got the first look um, at the National Teacher and Principal Survey data from the U.S. Department of Education. And in that data, we saw that among schools that had teaching vacancies, 40% 
found it very difficult or were not able to fill their vacancies in special ed, 37% in physical science, 32% in ESL, bilingual, and math, right? And these numbers, of course, vary by state. Um, and there were big differences when you break it down, looking at the percentage of uh, students on free and reduced price lunch uh, served in those schools. Low-income schools were much more impacted. And of course, that's a pattern we see longstanding in the data. Um, shortages are a huge equity issue um, in our schools. Um, and so I just want to like name why this all matters, right? When schools don't have enough qualified teachers, they might cancel courses. They might increase their class sizes, staff a class with a substitute teacher or a teacher on an emergency style permit. And it goes without saying that none of this is good for kids learning. Um, so that's just a little bit of a snapshot, I think, of where we're at and why it matters. Yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you very much. So Rob, uh, what, what's the AFT's take? What are you, what are you seeing uh, on a question of the teachers we lack and where? Well, I think what we're seeing from our members is very similar to what Tara was talking about. Uh, when we surveyed our members, 92% of our teachers said there was a shortage of teachers in their school. And that's pretty much almost, that's pretty significant. And, um, and they're exactly the same as what we were talking, math, science, special service providers, OTPTs, those kind of shortages, which have been around for a long time, have really actually grown in this time. So we see more of a shortage in those areas. But what we also are seeing is shortages in places like very difficult, uh, more urban settings, you know, schools that treat the more vulnerable of our students, seeing shortages in where we used to have a historically strong supply of teachers in grade school teachers early, mm -hmm. especially in the intermediate grades as well. First, not first and second grade as much as we're seeing fourth, fifth, and sixth. So we're seeing a, a, a kind of a, a, a mixture there, but it's like, like we said, it's not the same, the shortage is not universal across, you know, it's different. And urban schools and rural schools have a much bigger challenge than more affluent suburban schools. And we see that. And unfortunately, what we've also seen this year is our suburban schools have been learned uh, how to poach teachers, for lack of a better way to say it, from other schools. They know their shortages, they know where they need, and they actually create almost a larger shortage in other urban or rural schools because of their ability to poach teachers. So I, I see this as, as, you know, pretty common sense. We've had the problem before. It just kind of expanded. Uh, we can talk about why that is in a little bit. Thank yeah, you. for sure. Yeah, thanks. That, that's super helpful as well. To quote, I, uh, TNTV works with, what, four or 500 different school districts across the country. Uh, what problems uh, on the human capital front are they trying to solve? Yeah, so so agree with everything that Tara and, and Rob said. I would I, I just want to state explicitly uh, to reinforce a couple of points that they made that this is not a new problem. I mean, we've seen this coming. It is certainly is exacerbated, I think, by COVID. The second question we get from leaders is, is it a pipeline issue or an attrition issue? And as you've heard sort of Tara and Rob talk about the data, it is, it is neither, it is both, right? Uh, it's not an either or. And but it, the nuance is really important to call out because I think as Rob is is mentioning in the districts in the places that we work we can be in a state and there are some states with still you know we actually recommend to get to quality and I want to just go ahead and bring that word into the conversation early everyone's talking about warm bodies just quantity but to actually get to quality and effective teachers you actually need about five candidates per vacancy and so district are seeing like point you know five if you know that we're nowhere near those numbers these days um, but it is certainly nuanced by in schools and districts that serve concentrations of minority students and or concentrations of students coming from poverty and the last thing I'll say given the sort of the the, the focus on the fact that it's nuanced we are seeing a lot of data where it's a zero-sum game districts are you know trying to do what they can to to borrow Rob's word of poaching 
and, and that's not going to solve the problem. We're robbing Peter to pay Paul versus sort mm -hmm. of seeing districts and regions come together to actually take a more holistic approach to solving both the pipeline issue and the attrition issue. Yeah, thank you. So Dan, you've, uh, in your research, uh, looked at the challenge of teacher shortages longitudinally, uh, going back a, a long time, in fact, in some instances. What does your research tell you? To, to Tom, I have nothing to add, except no. <laughs> I <laughs> no, don't believe I, that, I'll, Dan. I'll, 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 no, no. I'll, I'll say a couple of things, but I really <laughs> ditto to everything that has, has been said thus far. Um, I want to just uh, begin by saying, providing a little context. Nationally, if we look just at the number of people that are getting credentials to teach, and the number of people that um, the number of, of slots that are filled by by novices, there are tens of thousands to in some years hundreds of thousands of more people that are getting the credential than there are open slots to novices. So when you look at that kind of level of aggregation, it would seem as if there's not a teacher shortage. But that, of course, is not the right way to look at it because teacher credentialing is a state function, and so that there's variation across states. And as the you know everyone has said, there are really, really big differences across subject matters, um, and that the kind of school that we're talking about staffing, um, th that there, there are differences. Some schools, when there's a, a slot that's open, there's a line out the door to try and fill it. And other schools, generally the schools that are serving more disadvantaged students, um, have a much harder time hiring teachers, even in the area where there's less dire shortage, uh, elementary education. So you asked sort of longitudinally, this is not a new problem. Um, this was something that, you know, came up in the at various points in the 90s, you know, around the dot com bubble. It came up before the Great Recession. It came up um, around 2015, 2016. And here we are again talking about the same thing. I think that the 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 reason why we're talking about the same fundamental underlying issues is because the solutions that we often come to are not don't, don't reflect the nuance of the problem. So I look forward to the part of the conversation where we get into the nuance of the solution that reflects the nuance of the problem. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Uh, Heather, what's your take from the state perspective where you were for a long time in Massachusetts and now also uh, from the national with a national perspective at NCTQ. I think much of what my colleagues have said, I don't want to be redundant and repeat. I would just add, I think it's really important to consider why it matters, as Tara said, and also to think about it, like if our vision is to build and sustain and retain an effective, diverse teaching workforce, what are the conditions, the policy conditions that we need to put in place to ensure that that happens? Uh, and I think particularly all this narrative about the shortage, uh, lacking nuance as it does, means that we're also damaging our own profession in this conversation. So the more we talk about how difficult it is to fill positions, the more it looks like this is a really unattractive job and role. And so I think we really need to consider um, how we characterize the teaching profession, how we characterize the immense impact that can be made, and how we specifically consider the policies and practices to attract and retain the most diverse and most effective workforce we can, especially now in the wake of the pandemic. Super helpful. So let's let's talk a little bit uh, about um, what's causing the shortage. Let's really let's go a little deeper on that because we've touched on it slightly. But but Heather, why don't you start with that one? Sorry about that. I was getting to my mute button. I know you can all relate. So thanks for your patience. Um, okay, so what's causing the shortage? There's a shortage of a number of things that are contributing to the shortage. And I'm just going to name four. Um, first, we have a shortage of robust, accurate, timely state district school level data 
to really understand and connect the teacher supply, meaning the teachers we prepare, to the demand, meaning where are teachers needed, where are their vacancies. And so that's a problem because it means, I think as Dan said, we're creating policy in the dark, uninformed by data. And it means it's really blunt and can't be as targeted as, and as impactful as we'd like it to be. Um, second, we have a lack of strategic differentiated compensation that can incentivize great teachers to stay in schools and subjects where they're most lead needed or to attract folks who may be considering other career options to subjects and regions of our states that, that really need them. Um, third, there's, I think I just said this a minute ago, but I'll reiterate, there's really a lack of attention to policies that promote greater teacher retention. Um, especially things like how do we consider policies that can better support school environments that retain teachers of color, working conditions that promote belonging for staff as well as students. And then I think there's also a lack of attention and conversation about the importance of effective school principals um, and how to support them to be effective in supporting teachers. And fourth, there's been a lack of attention or a lack of conversation about teacher preparation and the power that teacher preparation programs have to make sure that new teachers get the knowledge, skills, and practices they need in order to enter classrooms and feel successful with students and in order to stay. Yeah, yeah that's super helpful. Can I just ask you a quick, quick follow-up? You're talking about the need for, for, for data. Um, uh, what is the role of ed schools in that, uh, in understanding the supply and demand uh, for teachers, which, as as you all have said in different ways, uh, is a uh, local market, right? The demand for teachers is is largely local, unlike college professors, for which there is, to a large extent, a, a national market, right? Um, so it means that that the, those local entities, uh, regional entities, maybe that are training teachers at schools and and related institutions. Uh, uh, have a have a sort of central role. What what could they uh, should they be doing, or what are they not doing? If that's the way to say it, at, currently out there on the I mean, on the data front. I think there again, ed schools are varied, but um, I think this is where states can also set standards for program review and approval of teacher preparation programs. And what I mean by setting standards is set expectations that teacher preparation programs meet the demands of the markets they serve. So uh, being really clear that districts are consumers of teacher preparation programs, and therefore teacher preparation programs need to prepare the teachers that those districts need. The state also has a responsibility here in that in terms of the data systems, if, if ed prep programs can't predict because the state doesn't have the data where those vacancies will be, it's very difficult for them to be able to respond to the predicted vacancies. And so there again, they're just, they're accepting candidates into their teacher preparation program without knowledge of exactly how many teachers are predicted to be needed and in which subjects and which grades and for which regions. And that's not um, saying really fully their fault. Can I, can I just jump in and say, sure. I, I agree with what Heather said. I, I think it's, it's, it's hard for ed schools to adjust to the dynamics of, of the market um, for the reasons that were stated and because they have their own set of incentives, which will sometimes cut against, um, you know, the, the, the needs of the, of the labor market. So states could do some things that um, would make a difference. I would argue that the reason why we keep talking about the same fundamental issues around the subject areas where we struggle and the kinds of schools where we struggle to staff classrooms is because we do not send very clear signals to prospective teachers about the needs of the labor market. And so, you know, it, the, the clearest signal is, is compensation. Um, and I think it was Heather who talked about strategic compensation. I think that that's something that we ought to get into is what, what would that mean? But also you could imagine states, if the, the political or cultural issues around changing compensation in certain ways are too tough to surmount, you could imagine states could use data to say, hey, the prospects that you're going to end up with a job in the area where you're getting credentialed are and give some probabilities, which we could 
calculate because we have a long history of seeing that there are some areas where if you get credentialed, you're much more likely to be in the labor market in the next year and other areas where if you get credentialed, you're probably not so likely to end up as a public school teacher. Super helpful. I want to come back to causes and, and give uh, Rob a chance to sort of share his insights on that front. Thank you. And I, boy, listening to people talk, boy, do I want this panel to go on and on and on. I have lots of good, good things. I think that we, obviously the AFT has done a lot of internal data on this. It's not like we just, we, we survey our members all the time. So let me give you the top three that our members say are causing the shortage. Number one, we talked about salaries, compensation. That's not gonna surprise anybody. Number two is lack of respect from administration. And number three is the amount of work unrelated to what they're teaching or what their job is. Those are the top three in, the, you know, in our survey when we talked about the shortage with our teachers. Every, everybody knows salaries at the top of the issue. That's talk, the average teacher today, the new teacher today is paid 20% less per hour than every, every other college graduate. And that they just can't pay their bills and they can't raise a family on that. That's a fact. So and when we talk about raising salaries, we're talking about not because they go into it to get the money, it's because they can't stay in it because they don't have enough to raise a family or pay their bills. It's that simple. And we hear people talk all the time, you didn't get in it to, for the money, but you, you have to pay bills. And that, that, that kind of statement just ignores the reality of life that our members face. Yeah. And another thing that's important, and I, we, I come from a point of view of talking to teachers. I mean, I spent last summer all over the country on focus group with teachers about the shortage. And every teacher can tell you in, this, in America about one of their peers or somebody who left teaching who today is financially better off mentally and fi financially better off today because they're not putting up with what teachers have to put up with right now. And although it's, although they love what they do, teachers will tell you, in fact, our surveys will show they love what they do. It gets to a point of, you know, is it a, is it a safe love? Can they move in their families? Can they do what they need to do to survive in that love? And another thing I want to point out, I just gave you the top three or three of the top or two of three of the top. Two of them cost virtually nothing. When we talk about respect and we talk about, you know, giving teachers time to do what they, a lot of that doesn't take a lot of, a lot of money. But we've created a culture in our schools to where some things that are almost free to do are impossible to do because we've created this system in our schools that are focused on so many other uh, systems of accountability and other driving forces that sometimes we lose the focus on just trying to help people do their job. Yep. We create this back and forth and that's a problem. And before I stop, I wanna give one more and I could go on because we have a lot of them, but I would be not, I would not do my the members right if I didn't mention the current political environment that is now permeating schools. Our, our recent surveys show very clearly that making schools the center of politic, political attacks is not helping at all. And that is really having a, a significant uh, impact on our teachers' well being. And I, I think. What our teachers would say is, schools have teachers have kind of moved are more cogs than they are colleagues in the system right now. That's how they would see themselves, mm -hmm. and and I think that that's a real problem, yeah. and we need to figure out a way to change that. And so I'll just stop there and, and see what questions come up. But I, I I appreciate it. I appreciate giving the time. Thanks, Tom. Sure. So I, I have a quick follow up. So you mentioned. Couple of different ways the importance of of uh, respecting teachers uh, and uh, the need to also um, diminish the unrelated work sort of so-called unrelated work that they mm -hmm. uh, are asked to do. Can, uh, 
you know, fair points. What what are a couple of examples okay. of each of those? Perfect, yeah. how, how do we respect teachers more fully beyond the compensation side, for example? And well, what workload can we take off their plates? Thanks, Tom. Uh, I think that when we talk about the respect, the respect of their professionalism, have them be part of the decision-making process in the schools. Too many times people have decided that there's a problem with our teachers. And so we don't want to let them have any say, we don't let them teach the way they want to teach. One of the things that pops up in our survey all the time is I want to teach in a way that the kids need, but I'm limited because of different rubrics I'm being held accountable to. And that's a problem. When we talk about respect, we talk about valuing the teacher's professional, valuing their voice, valuing their decision-making in the classroom and not overriding that from outside. Okay. The second thing, when you talk about, you know, what is the work that moves away? Paperwork. Our teachers will tell you they spend a lot of time creating work product for other people. They create data and fill out paper and it goes out to somewhere they never see it again. Mm -hmm. They're filling out forms. They're filling out paperwork. They're filling out all these reports for people somewhere else. And it doesn't help them improve their teaching in the classroom, doesn't improve what they're trying to do with their kids. It's just work product for somebody else to use somewhere else. Got it. And unfortunately, until we make that connection, that somehow, this, and we look at that, is it really helping or not helping? teachers are going to say, why am I doing this? And it, it's taking me away from what I'm trying to do with my students in the class. I lose time. I lose precious time that I have with my kids. Fair enough. Tom, Thank could you. I jump in with two shortages that I feel like we haven't really raised? Two Please drivers, do. if you will, that I feel like we haven't raised here. Yep. One, one is the fact that if acknowledging, so I will say, and, I, and I've said it publicly before, we actually have a national crisis on our hands. And the reason I mentioned that, I was recently at the... Um, Ronald Reagan, um, the Rise Institute, we were talking about, you know, it's no, no, um, so, you know, issue that this is, we're coming up on the 40th anniversary of a nation at risk, right, which was our, you know, big movement to really galvanize and, and improve our outcomes for kids, particularly, right, and, you know, the science is to make us competitive. Well, you need a teaching workforce to create all of our workforce, and so we're, we're talking about the teacher shortage, but I think we're, we're not really grappling with the fact that this has resounding implications. If we don't have an adequate workforce of teachers, that means we don't have an adequate workforce of products, if you will, for of the students coming out of our K-12 systems. That, right. that affects every industry, every sector, literally in our country. And the reason I mention that is because we still talk about the teacher shortage as a K-12 issue. It yeah. is not. It is a community and a national issue. And I, the, the, the analogy that I use, so I live in Arkansas, but right outside of Memphis, is that, you know, if FedEx, which is where um, Memphis is, 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 you know, headquarters for, if FedEx has a, you know, shortage of, you know, workers, you don't see Fred Smith on the news trying to defend himself and say, I'm doing this all arms, all hands on deck to make sure that there is a viable workforce for that industry, that job, so that FedEx doesn't leave Memphis, right? And so every single community has a responsibility to educate its students, which means that that's often one of the um, larger, if not one of the largest um, employers in a community. And yet there's no galvanizing effort by leadership outside, mostly, I don't know, there are some places, but sort of, I guess the point I'm making, we can't keep only putting it in the box of just a K-12 issue. The second point I wanna make, there is an untapped lever around prioritizing diversity. Our students in our country now, we're up to over 53% of students identify as students of color, and yet 80% of our teachers are white. I'm not by any means saying, oh, let's go fire all of our white teachers, but there's something that tells you in just from the math alone, if we have more students of color, guess what? That means there are more adults with them and we are under tapping into the lever of diversifying our, our uh, teacher workforce as a strategy to both have more diverse and effective teachers, but to at the same time help address some of the shortage problems that we're seeing as well. Great, thanks. Tara, I wanted to get uh, ask you if, if there are additional, uh, if you have additional insights into what's driving teacher shortages. Well, 
I mean, it's super important points that Tequila just made, but, um, you know, just to, to step up a level from this conversation. So one of the things I'm taking away and we see in the data, right, is there's been a long-term decline in enrollments in teacher preparation programs. They're down about a third between 2010 and 2018. So our supply pipeline has shrunk, right? We're in this moment where we have increased demand. There's a lot of federal recovery money that's supporting learning recovery. We need more folks in schools with the huge task in front of us, but that's also driving uh, increased demand right now. Um, and then everybody here has talked about, right? High rates of teacher attrition is driving our shortages across the country. My colleagues, Desiree Carver-Thomas and Linda Darling-Hammond um, did a study back in 2018 that looked at that. And pre-pandemic anyways, uh, you know, we saw that nine out of 10 vacancies every year were driven by teacher turnover. And only a third of those folks are leaving at retirement age. Two thirds um, of those leavers were leaving because pre-retirement, right? Because of dissatisfaction um, in some way with the teaching profession for all the reasons that folks here have talked about. Um, so I think we need to look both at the pipeline and recruitment into the profession and on the back end at retaining the teachers that yep. we have. Great, thanks. So let's go deeper on solutions. So as you know, uh, uh, states and school districts have been responding to shortages with a wide range of different strategies, you know, from removing requirements that teachers have college degrees to paying teachers to work more hours during a school day and, and lots of other things in between. So given your sense of the supply and demand uh, for teachers, what strategies should states and, and, and local education leaders be adopting to respond to the problem uh, and to call, I'll come back to you first on, on that one. Um, yeah, sure. So, so first of all, I mean, we, we are fortunate that there's been, you know, available funds through the, you know, American Recovery Act. I do caution around that people thinking that that's a silver bullet, that money is not in perpetuity, it will go away. So we are seeing some districts from a policy perspective leverage those dollars to help with some of the financial constraints, right? Like giving, you know, bonuses or using it, you know, to help, um, we recommend differentiated compensation, but, you know, to help with some of the compensation issues, the, the caution and the, the worry there is that if you're not sort of figuring out how to build a sustainable plan for in, in, uh, increasing teacher salaries, then you're just, you're, you're kicking the can. So, so that is one thing the districts are using, but that's our caution there. We're not seeing districts address the long-term sort of structural uh, way that we compensate teachers. The other piece I will say, we're thinking of it as sort of some do now and do later. So there's some time proven like short-term things that districts can be doing, like prioritizing teacher vacancies for those hard to staff schools and hard to staff subjects, right? You know, uh, also one of the things we've been talking about for years is that adopting some of these, you know, low to no cost differentiation strategies that we address even when we publish the irreplaceables, right? That a district could do today, and those are low to no cost, that address some of those preventable reasons that teachers are leaving. And then the last one, we are still seeing districts not have, we talk about not having good data nationally, districts often unfortunately don't even have good data to understand how to forecast and hire vacancies as early as possible. Another, the last driver I'll say a strategy we're seeing districts is to actually revisit how they even their staffing models. And what I mean by that is in the short term districts, you know, your a school is allocated X number of teachers. One of the things that, that is masked in the data that we have found by working on the ground even where teachers aren't leaving in droves, meaning resigning or retiring, they're going on leaves of leaves of absence. And so every leave of absence results in an empty classroom, right? So you're having to try to find a substitute, but then there's a shortage of substitutes. So I, I just wanna point out that mas that is masking some of the data. And so districts are also trying to figure out some creative ways to have both a more short-term sustainable pipeline of substitutes to address the vacancies, even while they try to bring in, we're recommending more mental health and more supports for teachers because we, we've all been talking about, you know, the trauma that students have been facing. Lots of districts, unfortunately, were, were a little bit too late to sort of pay more attention to the burden on teachers and trying to, you know, teach both kids in person 
and virtually. And so addressing some of those from an EAP, you know, mental health perspective is another strategy that some districts are using. And they're seeing their teacher absentee rates go down as a result because teachers are getting more support. Okay. Tara, what does LPI like? What's on your menu? Yeah, um, you know, when I think about what states and districts can be doing right now, I think about three kind of buckets of policy strategies, if you will. Um, the first is around providing broad access to high quality preparation, and in particular, right, in some of the areas of persistent shortage that we've talked about, right? So how do we ensure that folks can come into special education, into math and science, and have their preparation fully paid for, right? That's a pretty big incentive to come prepare and teach in those fields. Um, offering competitive compensation, which we've talked a little bit about and hopefully we'll come back to, and then supporting, developing, and retaining that existing workforce. I think there's a bucket of strategies in there and, um, and my colleagues here have, have talked about some of them, but like diving deeper into just that first piece, um, we see a lot of states um, kind of really investing in high retention pathways into teaching right now. So things like teacher residency, programs, right, where candidates can spend a full year um, working alongside an expert mentor teacher, being financially supported in that preparation, taking coursework, right, that's really tightly integrated with their practice in the school district, um, and where the ed prep program and the district are working closely together on that preparation. And so, you know, Texas just put $91 million of their ESSER funds into growing teacher residencies. Um, West Virginia, um, has expanded teacher residencies, is using their ESSER funds to provide stipends for residents. California has gone big here. Montana is piloting a residency program in rural districts. So we're seeing that strategy take off. Um, a number of states are also investing in grow your own programs, right? Recruiting people from the community who want to teach in the community and are more likely to stay there. Um, so Tennessee's Grow Your Own program, right, which they invested federal recovery funds in, just yep. was they just recently were approved by the US Department of Labor um, as a registered apprenticeship into teaching. So I think both Grow Your Own and residency models may be able to leverage some other funds, right? Workforce development funds, for example, um, to bring more people into teaching. All right, that's super helpful. Rob, uh, do you want to add just real briefly one or two other uh, sort of yeah, I, I, suggestions? I, I, yeah, I'm not going to get into the compensation because I figure we're going to talk about that in a separate question, but I'm going to add a couple more things. Another way is we, we need to bring services for kids into our schools. We need to start being, make sure the kids are ready to learn. Teachers feel like they're doing everything. They're being asked to do everything. And it's trying to meet the needs of every kid all the time. They're doing everything they can, but sometimes we should just, our community should come together and not ask the teachers to be everything to all kids, but actually bring our community and the supports together. So community schools and those kind of things are important. We also have to look at the accountability systems we created. I mean, people are talking about differential compensation. It's like we're going back to race to the top. It's like, we're, we're trying to revisit and trying to change the outcome there. I, I think the reality of it is we have to figure out a way to value everything that goes on in schools along with academic achievement. And we've failed on that. And that's a big part of what we're dealing with right now in schools. The other thing I would do is protect the teacher's time. Our teacher's time you know, is not protected right now. And one of the biggest things we saw during the pandemic is when teachers are out, they're running a substitute. It was just okay to, hey, I got these 30 kids and teachers understand they got nowhere to go. But the reality of it is when you start, when you start this day with 25 kids and you end the day with 55 kids and they're from a different class doing something different and then you're being held accountable for all those different things, people are, they're wondering, what is the system I'm working in? Is it really there for me? Is it there for the kids or is it just to pass time? And so we have to look at how we prepare our teachers, just like Tara was saying, I agree completely with Grow Your Own and all those programs. I think those are super important, but we have to just figure out a way 
to look at schools more holistically as what they're trying to do. And one more thing I'll add is we need to look at what we do in schools and stop saying every kid all the time has to follow the same drum. There's career and tech education that we should be building up. We should be doing a lot more and providing kids with more opportunities, more different opportunities than just everybody going doing the same thing. There, and, we need to relook at our schools and give kids more opportunity. And tie that very quickly back to the teacher shortage challenge. If the school is meeting the kids' needs, people in the school will be happy. They'll, the well-being will improve. And people will feel like they're working in a system that's working for them and their kids and everybody. We, we, we're, I think sometimes on these panels, we, we play down the well-being of teachers too much. And we, we're, we, we kind of talk to them way too per, paternalistically. Don't tell the teachers what's, you know, when, when somebody said earlier about, you know, we're talking down the profession. Well, teachers would say, if it's happening, why aren't we talking about it? You all talk about we have to have data to, uh, and deal with the question. Well, talk to us, get the data from us. Fair enough. Let me, let me move to Dan. Uh, what's, what's on your solution list, Dan? What, what you've touched on a little, a little, this a little bit, but, but go a little deeper if you'd like. It wouldn't be fun if there wasn't a little disagreement, right? So um, let me get into an area where I think that there may be some disagreement. I wanna come back to strategic compensation. I'd love to live in a world where teachers were paid like doctors, but that's not the world that we, we live in. Um, so I think that we have to think about if we have a pot of money, how do we allocate it? So if I had extra money to allocate towards teachers, and I think there's a lot you could do on the front end of the pipeline, but the clearest way that we could send signals about the, the needs would be to um, raise salaries, raise compensation for um, the high demand subjects. So special ed, STEM, ELL, um, pay people more if they are in um, schools serving disadvantaged kids, because that's where the, the problem is more acute, and um, to raise money at the front end of the salary schedule, when it probably sends a clear signal to prospective labor market entrance. Like right now, the teacher attrition rate does not, it's, it, there's, there's, teacher attrition is not actually that different than attrition in other professions, but attrition is very high at the, in the first, you know, three to five years of a teacher's career. And it is very low if you're talking about someone who's got, you know, 18, 20 years into the profession and, you know, is in her late 40s and sees a, a good size pension. So I think that we need to rethink just across the board salary increases as a solution to this problem and think about much more targeted ways of allocating compensation to areas where there's acute need. Heather. I would just give two, two examples of, the strate of strategic compensation. Um, in the spring of 2020, Hawaii instituted yep. uh, performance bonus, uh, excuse me, uh, bonuses, pay bonuses of $10,000 for teachers who would come and teach special ed, within one year, they cut their special ed vacancies in half. So I think to Dan's point, we if we have a limited pot of money, we have to direct it where it's needed the most in terms of incentivizing teachers to teach in the subjects or the regions where, where they're needed the most. And what's strange to me is that in terms of special ed, it's been the subject with, with very persistent teacher shortages for decades. Yet NCTQ's work reveals that fewer than half of the states, only 23, have policies that incentivize higher pay for teachers in hard to staff subjects generally. And only seven of these states specifically call out special ed as a subject for different differential compensation. So we're bemoaning the shortages and we're not using the resources available to us to target those shortages and bring teachers in. 
Helpful. To pull Thank on you. the thread, Tom, I mean, another yep. sort of lever that, that we're that we're under tapping, it connects to the grow your own and the apprenticeship model. So um, sort of the tenants behind the apprenticeship model, the beauty of it was it was not just a K-12 initiative right in Tennessee that, that led that it was a joint effort between the between the Department of, you know, the uh, Department of Education and Department of Labor and Workforce. And so what happens in that model, every state typically on the Department of Labor and Workforce side, they have their identified jobs that are high demand, but low, they don't have enough candidates. What's interesting, you rarely historically have seen teaching show up on that. So things like nursing or welders or truck drivers, and that unlocks state dollars to help those folks get credentialed in those areas. And so the beauty of the model in Tennessee, now that that program is a registered apprenticeship, it opens up dollars for those high demand but hard to staff job categories that um, then, again, this is this was my earlier point that now you're looking at it not just as a K-12 issue, but as a true sort of workforce issue. Now the elephant in the room, and, and maybe we'll get to this, I think is, as we think about credentialing and licensure and certification, one of the opportunities here is the some, some of the subjects that we're talking about, like secondary math, secondary science, you do need strong content, obviously, to be highly effective in those areas. Those are the very teachers that one thing the pandemic did do is show, it demonstrated to all industries that were struggling with their labor that, oh, wow, teachers bring durable skills and with content. And so whereas it used to be that, oh, teachers left, you know, a few teachers left the whole field, more often they left their district or their school. Now we're seeing the increase in teachers leaving the whole sector, going into the private sector or other industries to make way more money. That number has, that is, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but it has doubled tremendously. And the reverse is not happening because we just frankly have some, I think someone, you know, and asked the question, we have frankly some antiquated ways of looking at credentialing and certification that don't allow people with that content expertise to enter the profession in many states. And so I just, that, that is really relevant now because we're seeing droves leaving because opportunities in the private sector are opening up, but we don't have that similar pipeline for folks to be able to come in. Maybe they've done their stint you know, in the private sector and would like to teach, but they encounter numerous barriers to entry to get into the profession. Thank you, Tequila. Uh, let me, I'd like to extend that sort of issue just a little bit further because we've got a number of questions uh, in the Q&A that, that sort of get to this, to what but is a tension in some of the state and local responses to teacher shortages between quantity and quality. Uh, some, uh, as I said in my opening, uh, some states have, have lowered uh, uh, the expectation or uh, eliminated the expectation that teachers have bachelor's degrees. Others are uh, reducing or eliminating requirements for licensing exams. And, and you were alluding to this uh, Tequila, uh, to the latter. Uh, what what does the rest of the panel think uh, about this this tension between quantity and quality? How should we? How should policymakers be thinking about that right now? Uh, Tara, if you, you want to start, I mean, I would come back to like focusing on you know financially supporting folks to enter the profession, especially in our highest need subject areas, and especially for the schools you know, our high poverty schools in particular, which which are disproportionately affected by shortages. Um, I think, you know, there are some states that are pretty much removing any requirements for preparation to come into teaching. I think that's concerning, right? Because we know from the research that people who, who enter teaching, right, without like high quality preparation, comprehensive preparation that provides them with an opportunity to learn alongside an expert, right? To take coursework and pedagogy and methods, right? And understand children's development. People who enter without that leave at two to three times the rate of individuals who enter fully prepared. Um, so I think we need to, that's just a churn that's gonna happen and we'll be back in the shortage, you know, land very quickly um, if that's our approach. But then, 
I also want to point out that there are some states that are re-examining some of their licensure requirements, you know, to the to 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 the conversation um, that we were having earlier and providing multiple ways, for example, to demonstrate your subject matter competency. You absolutely need right subject matter expertise to teach, but you the, the only way to show it isn't necessarily through a multiple choice fill in the bubble test, right? If you've majored in science, are you prepared to be a science teacher? I would argue yes. And so states are are re-examining some of those policies, which I think is a, a positive trend. Thank you. Heather, what's your take on that? You can't teach what you don't know. Content is hugely important. And we know that uh, that licensure tests, content licensure tests predict effectiveness in classrooms. We also know that um, that as Tara said, we need we need to support teachers, aspiring teachers to attain the content knowledge they need because they come out of high schools with gaps in content knowledge and then they go into teacher prep programs and those gaps get exacerbated. So teacher prep programs need to um, be savvy about using diagnostic assessments to determine where their aspiring teachers have content gaps and how to shore those up. Um, so the licensure tests are hugely important. We've seen in the last two years that 12 states have lowered their standards for content licensure tests or removed them altogether. And those are the teachers, those unqualified teachers who haven't demonstrated that they know the content knowledge, who will go teach in the highest poverty schools with the highest percentages of students of color. And then we wonder why we're not making any traction in closing achievement gaps. And then those teachers leave because they don't have the content knowledge, so they're not successful with kids. They don't enjoy the job when they're not successful with kids, and then they leave. And then we have to fill those positions again. Aquila, any any uh, response to that? Yeah, I mean, the only thing to agree with that point, I think this whole notion, the same way I think we're rethinking what student success is and how to define it and measure it, I think we have to grapple with that same question as we think about how teachers do demonstrate their, um, their um, effectiveness. I agree totally with Heather that yes, the kind of in secondary subjects we've seen correlations when um, those folks have a, a higher ed degree, a master's degree. When we think about compensation, though, in you know districts that use step and lane, and like there's something about that when we only look at that one narrow entry point that doesn't consistently, consistently predict effectiveness. It just, I mean, a po any policy class analysis will tell you, you know, ask the question if it's not yielding the results. And our current frameworks of licensure and testing have not consistently allowed us to select and know who our most effective teachers are. And so I, we have definitely been working and pushing with stakes to identify additional ways to demonstrate effectiveness. Not saying we don't need a way, that is not at all what we're saying. We just need to explore some additional ways because the tools that we have now, their reliability in some areas has not always held up to be as um, consistent and valid. Fair enough. Since we're on uh, teacher training, uh, let me ask you this question from uh, one of our audience members. Is it possible there is a mismatch between what teachers are being trained to do in prep programs and then what, in fact, they are asked to do in a school? Uh, how yeah, so do we I'll jump in here, so I'll tell an interesting story. We're doing some work in Tennessee and uh, the, uh, Dean, the D Dean McIntyre there over the College of Ed has actually had her faculty come into schools with our teams and walk schools and, and look at how we're how we're to provide PD to sitting teachers today. And it was very eye-opening for those sitting faculty members. And it has helped them to really shift how they're training their teachers. But this is, again, an example. You don't see that often, right? Where higher ed is sort of getting in there with you. Um, but we, I'm really proud of that partnership. And we've learned a lot in what we could do to sort of help you know, higher ed, instead of just lamenting about it, help them. And so it's exciting to see deans like D uh, Dean McIntyre start to step up and say, hey, we need help in sort of up-leveling how we even approach training teachers. Okay, thank you. Rob, here's one for, uh, for you. Uh, are the uh, issues of low pay and low respect for teachers uh, more of a red state phenomenon or not? 
and others should feel. Uh, well, I, I think that to. you know, it's a matter of re respect for the public school system, uh, and you can leave that for what it is. I don't like to get into the politics of it. I think that you know, teachers' pay is down twenty percent in the last few decades. That's just overall. When we see this, you know, one of the things I'll, I'll connect back to what we were talking about when you were talking about states lowering their, uh, you know, their bars to get into teaching. Well, that's when you, well, that's when you come from a mindset is it's a set pot, and the set pot doesn't meet the needs right now. So as long as we got a set pot, what we got to do is get rid of the, of the things that are in the way of getting bodies in the classroom. When, when you say set pot, what are you referring to? Sorry. Well, when when we talk about a set pot of money ah. and we say we have to, you know, that kind when we set, we talk about a set pot of money and we just have to distribute how we have to distribute it. What you're doing is you're actually, that's exactly why those things happen. But Rob, there's a distinction between a set pot and an unlimited pot. So schools have, you know, $200 billion that they are allocating from the federal government. I, I mean, we this gets into the politics yeah, of it. Yeah. It's it's un, but like I don't know. I don't see another two hundred billion dollars coming in a couple. I, of years. I hear where you're coming, Dan, and what I'm saying is, uh, it pro this is probably a longer conversation because I don't believe, you know, moving the deck chairs of you know or redistributing money is the solution because you come from a limited pot, and then what happens? What you're tr basically trying to say is, teachers. This is some kind of only a money issue. And it's not. It's much more than that. Money yeah, plays a huge, money plays a big role because they have to pay their bills and all this kind of stuff. But when you start talking about some of these other levers, and we we don't talk about those things. And some of those things can have a, a big impact as well. But what I and I also one of the things that I've seen is a lot of people are talking about uh, how we change bring more quality people in i absolutely we're absolutely on board with that we're not look we don't want the bars to be lower we want them to be raised we want people in fact we have a report called raising the bar the the, the reality here is but that system has to be supported and oh we have schools have seen a tremendous amount of austerity over the last few decades and as long as we continue to say that's the way it's going to be, our schools are going to struggle, whether it's with staffing or with its, we're going to struggle as long as we keep on saying we we're only we're only limited in such way. We have to figure out a way to come together and figure out all the resources we can bring. Some of the resources, like I taught earlier, come from the community. Some of the, obviously the money from the, the legislatures and those kind of things. But all these things have to happen if we're going to address it. This problem isn't, didn't happen overnight, it's not gonna be solved overnight. It's gonna take a long, if we're serious about improving our schools, it's gonna take a collective long-term reflected effort because it's not as simple as just paying some bonuses here or there. And but I, I think I, we, can, we can walk and chew gum, right? We can say there are some acute needs and so we're gonna, allocate money to those acute needs at the same time that people might make the case for more money for public education. So, but where does that money come from, Dan? It comes from other teachers, right? It, it, I know. I mean, it comes from like the, the, the $200 billion that is flowed into the, into the, in pub, into public schools has not come from other teachers. It's come from all of us and it's come from our future generations so I, I mean, I think that we can do multiple things, right? This is where I'm talking about when we hear the language around set pots. I get that. This is why, Tom, we need another one of these discussions to go deeper into this one, because I'm, I'm absolutely willing to do that. Because uh, we, there is, this is one of the, we need to overcome some of the thinking we have out there if we're really going to address the teacher shortage problem in America. Well, on that note, uh, I will uh, say that that we have uh, benefited from a wide range of perspectives. Uh, so thank you very much, panel. Thank you very much, audience, for a lot of great questions, most of which we weren't able to get to, and I apologize for that. We will have a video of the webinar <clears throat> on the Future Ed website in the coming days. Uh, and until we have our next uh, session, I'd be happy to get everybody back together.
Happy holidays. Thank you all.